Maria Theresa Walburga Amalia Christina of Austria was born on May the 13th, 1717. She was the first and only woman to rule the Habsburg dominions. She was also the last of the head of the House of Habsburg, as, after her marriage, the royal house was renamed the House of Habsburg Lorraine. She was sovereign of Austria, Hungary, Bohemia, Croatia, Mantua, Milan, Galicia and Lodomeria, Parma, and the Austrian Netherlands from 1740 until her death. Upon marriage, she became Duchess of Lorraine, Grand Duchess of Tuscany, and Empress Consort of the Holy Roman Empire. She is considered part of the group of enlightened despots. She headed one of the most important states of her time, ruling much of Central Europe. Also, this powerful empress was the mother of the notorious Marie Antoinette. From 1282 until the end of World War I in 1918, the Habsburgs commanded the destiny of Austria. Maria Theresa was one of those leaders. From the Middle Ages onwards, they all turned small estates into an empire. By the 16th century, it encompassed Eastern Central Europe, Spain, and the teeming South American colonies. Maria Theresa was born on May the 13th, 1717, in the imperial capital of Vienna. She was the eldest daughter of Charles VI and Elizabeth Christine de Brunswick Wolfenbüttel. Her father was considered friendly but distant, often adamant about his goals. Her mother was described as a beautiful and very determined woman. As an infant, Maria Theresa was baptized in a grand ceremony, but she was not yet considered a valuable child. This label was reserved for a male child. A year earlier, a male heir had been born to the great joy of his parents, but he was buried only a few months later. Infant mortality was high at that time. After that, two more girls were born, but the emperor father desperately wanted a male heir to keep the dynasty alive. Maria Theresa was brought up according to the guidelines applied to an emperor's offspring. She had learned languages, religion, history, and court etiquette. She sang, was an excellent dancer, and had a knack for drawing. In her family's opinion, she was a sweet and darling child. She was pampered by the family, as well as being subjected to the court's strict rules. Fortunately for her, she did not have to undergo the military exercises that were compulsory for young heirs to the throne at that time. Instead, she enjoyed the company of Countess Maria Caroline Fuchs, a friend she kept all her life. Maria Theresa was praised for her command of foreign languages. She spoke and wrote Latin, Spanish, Italian, and French with ease, speaking with eloquence. There were several accounts from the Empress's tutors, saying that the young princess's manners were simply lovely. In 1733, Sir Thomas Robinson, a British envoy to Vienna, wrote of the 17-year-old, She can already reason. She strives to be informed about affairs. She admires her father's virtues but condemns mismanagement and has such a governmental and ambitious temperament that she considers him little more than her administrator. Charles VI, the father she so admired, was becoming increasingly depressed. However talented she was, Maria Theresa could not make up for the lack of a male child. However, he had planned the succession wisely in years advance, with a pragmatic sanction, before Maria Theresa was ever born. The purpose of this decree was to forestall disputes after his death legally protect hereditary estates from both internal and external forces to the empire, ensure the unity of inherited lands, and allow his eldest daughter to ascend the throne if he had no male heir. Charles VI had confidence in contracts and signatures, but that quickly proved to be a mistake. Maria Theresa's father invested a lot of time, money, and effort to convince the European powers to accept the situation. But he paid a high price, as a supplicant, he made many political and economic concessions. However, Charles VI did not have the time, money, or energy to reform his empire internally. The 55-year-old man died suddenly on October the 20th, 1740, causing a situation no one wanted. Without a male child, Maria Theresa became the heir to the throne. Everyone, and not just the Viennese court, was anxious to know what would happen. Would she be fit to rule? And, wouldn't be being ruled by a woman be undignified? Greatly shaken, 
the 23-year-old Maria Teresa was overwhelmed by the events following her father's death. Although she had inherited the vast empire, or rather a colorful collection of lands and regions, she had never really prepared herself to rule this conglomeration of different ethnic and cultural traditions on her own. Wouldn't Maria Teresa's husband eventually be in charge of affairs of state? Maria Teresa had no such opinion. She was the heiress and wanted to rule the empire. When her father died, she had already been married for four years. After considering her options, Francis Stephen, from the insignificant Duchy of Lorraine, was chosen as her husband. Despite this arrangement, it was a marriage out of love, which also had the political blessing of Europe's major powers. The young man, whom she had known as a child and liked even then, quickly emerged as a Prince Charming. Maria Theresa led a carefree life between her grand marriage in 1736 and her father's death four years later. She gave birth to several daughters consecutively, something that caused the depressed Charles VI to fall into utter despair. First, no male heir, and then not even a grandchild. Maria Theresa was pregnant for the fourth time when he was buried this time with a son. Three more would follow. Between the ages of 20 and 39, she had 16 children. The new situation in 1740 changed the young couple's lives overnight. Above all, Maria Theresa's youth and inexperience were a source of provocation. In several European state chancelleries, rumors began to circulate as to whether the 23-year-old was really the rightful heir. Family hereditary claims to the throne began to emerge, backed by a willingness to defend those on the battlefield if necessary. Bavaria did not recognize the pragmatic sanction, nor did the old enmity with France bode well for the future. And she had another immediate challenge. Frederick II, the new Prussian king, only a few years older than Maria Theresa, ascended the throne in the same year. He wanted to make an impact and seize the opportunity to gain political and military glory. And then another shock came. Frederick II quickly occupied the Silesian province and put serious military pressure on the young ruler. However, she was recognized as the head of her empire. Maria Theresa probably received the empire at the worst possible moment. There was a front against her being formed by Prussia, Bavaria, Saxony, France, and Spain. She quickly realized that she could not defend her empire. The army was destroyed and the finances ruined. The young woman in Vienna responded, but not as expected. She began to fight, first in her mind. She refused to accept the predicament. She refused to give up what she was legally entitled to, or in her opinion, had been entrusted to her by God's grace. Maria Theresa initially tried to understand the situation, to take stock of events and the urgent need to act. With the help of her father's secretaries, she sorted out the chaos. The aim was to display decisive leadership. She attended many conferences and studied numerous archives. She wanted to rule, command, organize, and be tough when necessary. But much of what she said at that time proved her inexperience and caused unrest. Later, Maria Theresa openly admitted that she anticipated her own downfall. At that point, she asked for one thing in those prayers, that God would open her eyes to state affairs. With God's grace, anything is possible. This statement of hers became legendary. Of course, she was smart enough to recognize that her duty was to do something to earn that grace. In front of her advisors, she stressed several times how important it was to show loyalty and zeal. She wanted at her side assertive and bold men, who would not discourage her or play down the real danger of the empire's collapse. The result was the War of Austrian Succession. She had good advisors, and, with her remarkable commitment and talent, she found military allies. In 1741, almost all the European powers came into conflict. Everyone had victories and defeats, suffering the atrocities of war, as is always the case. Ultimately, Maria Theresa signed peace treaties and abdicated occupied Silesia. But, against all expectations, she asserted herself in the face of a seemingly superior coalition of enemies. With the exception of Silesia, her hereditary possessions remained almost all in her hands. 
Maria Theresa and her greatest adversary, Frederick II, never met in person. The Habsburg now have a man, and he is a woman, he ironically said. And, towards the end of his time, he acknowledged in writing, This woman could be compared to a great man, consolidated her father's faltering monarchy. She honored the dynasty. However, as a woman, she was a victim of a seen male mockery and cynicism during her lifetime. She became a huge figure in her day. During this period, Maria Theresa knew that the empire could not remain as before. Changes were needed. Under external pressure, she began to make reforms. She, the cheerful and exuberant woman who loved to have fun and socialize in youth, proved to be an energetic ruler who also expressed her will unequivocally. Through her action, her husband Francis Stephen was elected Holy Roman Empire, King of Germany, and crowned in Frankfurt. She attended the coronation, although she was again pregnant. However, she refused to kneel beside him. From that moment on, she was designated Empress, a title she treasured. Back in Vienna, Empress Francis I, the name by which Francis Stephen was now known, was pleased to return to the back seat as co-regent. He did not mind. He lived his dream and devoted himself to finance and science. In whatever the case, dear Mary held the reins tightly, but he was always there for her when needed. By then, Maria Theresa was sure of something else. A state's power and wealth depended on its population's strength. She transformed her empire from top to bottom. She wanted to centralize government to better hold the empire together. To do this, she needed an efficient administration and a modern state governed by law. She overhauled the justice system, promoted and modernized science and research, introduced compulsory education, and established a military academy. In 1754, she founded an academy of Eastern languages. The Vienna court knew how necessary and significant knowledge of that part of the world was. Abolishing torture was a widespread priority of all enlightened monarchs in Europe at that time. The same for Maria Theresa. She acted in her own way, trying to find a middle ground when making reforms, reducing inherited privileges and traditions, changing people's attitudes towards them. This instinct and common sense is considered one of the greatest achievements of her government. Disagreements with Prussia were constant. The diplomat Kaunitz presented her with an extensive analysis of Europe's political landscape. He dissected power relations, interests, and predictable development, coming to a conclusion that surprised Maria Theresa. He advised the Empress to abandon her old traditional alliance with Britain and put an end to the old enmity with France. A reversal of alliances would be helpful in facing the constant peril coming from Prussia. The House of Habsburg and the House of Bourbon, long-time enemies, would be strategic partners of the future. In the past, Britain had not proved to be the reliable partner Vienna had hoped for. It was a preposterous idea, but Maria Theresa believed the unthinkable. The plan became a strategy. Maria Theresa sent Kaunas to France to accomplish the diplomatic goal. He had arguments, appreciated French peculiarities, and was familiar with the complicated webs of power and influence in the French court fanciers. The project was a success, although it required great diplomatic effort. The Vienna-London alliance was replaced by the one with France, Vienna's archenemy. The reversal of Europe's alliance systems went down in history. For Maria Theresa, the idea and motivation were not only to surround and repel the new Prussian power, the alliance was also an attempt to reconquer Silesia. The new alliance was first put to the test in 1756, when the Seven Years' War broke out. France and Britain faced each other in bloody struggles for supremacy, along with their allies. In addition to this military alliance, Empress Maria Theresa sent her youngest daughter, Marie Antoinette, aged 15, to seal the Great Reconciliation with France. The young woman would marry the future King Louis XVI. The rest we already know. Maria Antoinette died on the guillotine during the French Revolution. When the bloody rebellions broke out in 1789, when anger and frustration exploded at the ignorance, arrogance, and waste of the French court, Maria Theresa had already been dead for nine years.
Before then, she saw what occurs when a young teenage girl, without the same values or qualities as her mother, is given important tasks. As a mother, Maria Theresa was for years concerned about her daughter, Marie Antoinette, her eccentric life at the French court and her squandering. She often criticized the young woman, who, in essence, was the Queen of France. Maria Theresa tried several times, threatened, and pleaded. Don't you say that I scold you, that I lecture you. Instead, say, Mother loves me and wants me to be well. I must believe her and comfort her by following her good advice. The Empress said, resignedly, Happiness can disappear very quickly, and you may end up plunged, by your own action, into the greatest calamities. You will realize everything one day, but it will be too late. Maria Theresa made this pessimistic prediction in 1775. Fourteen years later, it came true. Maria Theresa's reign took place during the Age of Enlightenment and Reason, the age of emancipated ways of life. Everything was questioned, analyzed, and explained. The Inquisitive no longer looked so often to the sky for explanations of the visible and the invisible. As a child, Maria Theresa was not sent on an educational trip as was the custom of the young nobility at that time. Even during her reign, she rarely left Vienna. The trips were expensive and strenuous. Apparently, she also had no need to be challenged by intellectuals at sophisticated round tables, like her opponent Frederick II. In the Prussians' case, the meetings of distinguished men at the Potsdam Palace were legendary. Voltaire, the old king of philosophy among the French Enlightenment, went especially to Prussia to converse with the young ruler. On the other hand, Maria Theresa had no time for Enlightenment works and rejected them. Reading and discussing French revolutionary writings aroused her suspicion. In 1770, when her daughter Marie Antoinette left to marry the French heir, she received strict instructions from her mother. Do not read any book, however banal, without the approval of your confessor. This is even more important in France than elsewhere. One always publishes books that are apparently pleasant and erudite, but behind this respectable facade, they are an affront to religion and morals. Tolerance, inclemency, and equality of ideas were the maladies of the time, according to Maria Theresa. Even her eldest son and successor to the throne, the future Joseph II had to constantly hear stories about how she opposed the misguided allure of Enlightenment philosophers. Deeply influenced by Catholicism, the ruler opposed attempts at civil tolerance towards other religions. She deeply believed that, without a dominant religion, tolerance and indifference would spread, and that undermines everything. She brought various Enlightenment ideas to Vienna, often at the suggestion of her husband, Francis Stephen. In 1765, Francis died unexpectedly. It was a dark period for the Empress, with lasting political as well as personal consequences. She was virtually paralyzed by the shock and grief caused by her husband's death. I no longer recognize myself, and plunged into endless mourning. From then on, everything became a burden. This personal blow brought her down and took away her strength to get back on her feet. A few weeks later, she also faced the death of her two close advisors. In 1765, Maria Theresa appointed her son, Joseph, as co-regent. In fact, she wanted to renounce the throne, but she backed out. The next 15 years until her death were characterized by deep generational conflict, daily friction between mother and son, opposing views, disappointments, and accusations, but also desperate affirmations of deep affection. But the old formula no longer worked. The world had changed, and Maria Theresa did not understand that. It made her suspicious of many around her. She believed it was necessary to watch everything, put spies behind her offspring, and repeatedly argue with them because she believed she was wiser. In 1778, two years before she died, her son Leopold wrote about his mother. Owing to her age and corpulence, she began to have great difficulty in walking. She breathed heavily when she walked, and, ashamed of it, she became more and more sullen and disconsolate. Her memory deteriorated greatly, and she could no longer remember many things or orders she gave. She repeated herself often, which caused great confusion. She was uncertain about many things and constantly distrusted herself and others. She didn't like anything and was always lonely and melancholic, 
as she never had company, worrying about everything. In short, she was getting old. This and similar accounts were made about the elderly ruler and mother. Maria Theresa knew this. The hour few expected came. The Empress Maria Theresa died on the grey November 29th, 1780. She was 63, lazy and ill, exhausted by 40 years of challenging work and 16 children. She was buried in a magnificent double sarcophagus in the Capuchin Crypt, also known as the Imperial Crypt, in central Vienna, alongside her beloved Francis Stephen of Lorraine. After her death, the House of Habsburg also disappeared, replaced by the House of Habsburg Lorraine. Joseph, who was already co-regent of the Habsburg domains, succeeded his mother. Maria Theresa left a revitalized empire, which influenced the rest of Europe during the 19th century. Her descendants followed her example and continued the reforms.